Hi, I'm Dr. Michael Wolf, and welcome to Altitude. This program is all about you, for those interested in science, technology, engineering, the arts, and mathematics. We have a wide array of topics that we're going to cover today, and we're very glad that you joined us. We hope that by understanding what it takes to get into STEAM, this program will show you real people that have experience in STEAM as well as other technology areas. So today, uh, we hope that you really consider taking more classes, taking degrees and certificates that give you much better options in life. You can choose better jobs, careers, and education. So by being gritty, you actually will be far better off down the road. So let's get started. And we know that you can do this. The show uh, today, we have the Minnesota STEM Partnership. And that organization is intended to provide activities and options for you in jobs, careers, and education. Plus, we also have a few friends with us. We're going to talk what they're doing here locally in the Twin Cities, as well as what they plan to do in the future across Minnesota. <laughs> In just a few moments, you're going to hear from those that are doing coding, drone leagues, the arts, as well as robotics. This section, we're going to talk about the arts, part of STEAM. And with me is DJ Mickey Breeze. How are you doing today, Mickey? I'm all right, Michael. I'm you're doing just fine. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. So, Mickey, you know, I've, I've known you for a long time. I remember, I think the first time that I was introduced to you was through my son, Justin, Just mm. Wolf. Yep, yep. And you were, you were playing, I call it playing, because you know, y'all were, <laughs> were like 11 years old, but you were hitting on this little box that had like machines. So I'm going to ask you about that. Oh yeah, no problem but, at all. But how old were you when you started getting into the music seriously? So um, I've always been an instrumentalist. Uh, my grandfather taught me uh, piano when I was about five years old. Um, I started doing music production on a little game system, a PSP, at about uh, eight. Uh -huh. And then I started getting seriously into DJing and heavily into music production around 10. Okay. Yep. How did you get the equipment or how did you get inspired to do that? That's always fascinated me. I was always a real antisocial kid. Like I didn't do sports much or I didn't, I wasn't like a math lead or, you know, a real chess club person or anything like that. Um, and I didn't really do video games either, but mm -hmm. out of sheer irony, my older brother and my mom bought me a PSP, a game system for my eighth birthday, and I wasn't as hyped about it because that, uh, that wasn't much of my interest, mm -hmm. but I ended up finding a weird production software uh -huh. uh, called Beaterator. It was made by Rockstar Gaming and uh, Timbaland, the producer, Okay. And I started tooling around with that for like a good two, three years before I actually got like my first laptop and just uh, broke into, you know, more heavy, heavy music production and things like that. Um, the DJing aspect came from wanting to actually perform my stuff. Uh, my grandfather was more of a natural musician and everything like that. Mm -hmm. uh, used to play a lot of uh, concerts for places like Juilliard and Orchestra Hall and, oh, you know, very mm -hmm. abroad, but um, Big time. I was more into the, the performance aspect of it and, and creating something around just one instrument. Um, so, yeah, around about like eight or nine since my brother bought me a video game inadvertently, uh, I, had to, I had to figure out something to do with it. You sure. know, I couldn't just waste it. <laughs> so here you are now, uh, age 17. Yes, As indeed. I understand, you've been DJing across many, many different, everywhere I pop up and you're all over the <laughs> internet, you're on my Facebook feed. Yes, indeed. So tell me, what does a young person need to, to do? I know you um, had the opportunity to get a gaming system, <laughs> you had some equipment, but how can the, the regular kid get to where you're at? That's ultimately what we want to do is the, the technology and, you know, what do they need to have to really kind of get started to get to where you're at now? Uh, well, primarily a big PSA to kids and parents alike, support is definitely needed. Um, a, lot of, a lot of what I see from kids who want to start out on a musical career or some sort of artistic journey uh, what what's what they're lacking in is support and it doesn't necessarily have to be money but you know just the the security and assurance to know that whatever you do 
uh, someone is backing you. Like my mom was a very huge support for me. Uh, she was your momager. I yeah. remember some <laughs> some uh, some code word that y'all yeah. had on her business, momager. Yeah, like, uh, mom manager. Yeah, my mom was shout a, out to mom. Yes, indeed, Mama Breeze. Uh, my mom was a huge support for me when I was younger uh, in giving me the tools that I needed or letting me work for what it was that I wanted. Mm -hmm. um, but primarily you would just need a lot of motivation and consistency mm -hmm. in order to uh, go after what you want. Like a lot of times I would get producers block and you know a bunch of different projects that might not go my way, but consistently creating you know, finding the resources somewhere, whether it be at school or scraping up money from savings or birthday money and all mm -hmm. that type of stuff. It's just, you take what you got and you keep pouring it into what you want. Sure, and another thing like Prince, I mean, one thing that always resonated with Prince was not everybody is necessarily gonna like your music, right. but as long as you like your music and you can groove to it, that's the main thing. And right? that's exactly it. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, in the beginning of my career, I, I mostly started uh, tweaking around with making remixes of more popular songs. You know, I've always been, I've always been an old head. Mm -hmm. Mom raised me on uh, Marvin Gaye and Stevie Wonder and uh, Funkadelic and, Oh, just yes. Lucy Collins and so much old school stuff that like I never really fell into the mainstream. You mm -hmm. know, I, I, I barely listen to music with lyrics in it just because I like how the producers interpret like instruments and expressing themselves without words. Sure. Um, but I uh, kind of <laughs> I kind of broke into music production because I didn't, I wasn't really out to impress anybody. Mm -hmm. You know, I would remix songs because if I didn't like the way it was played on the radio, do it better. Yeah. You know, or do it your way, man. Well, we certainly wish you a lot of prosperity. Now, tell me this, what school do you go to? I, if I understand correctly, you go to a, a studio that encourages the arts. Oh yeah, I go to a high school for recording arts. Okay. Uh, here in St. Paul on Lexington. Uh, there, they they do uh, hone a lot of your creativity. Um, I have been making music since long before my high school years and everything like that. I bounced around a little bit uh, before I landed at HSRA, and primarily, what it was was I had my art form. I came to the school already performing and getting business and getting shows and things like that. Mm -hmm. But it opened up a lot of opportunities for me to to travel and collaborate with a bunch of different artists and all the resources that they have there with the with the studios and the equipment and all of the instructors and everything who teach about music theory and chord structure and things like that. So it was really a dope space and place for me to be as far as either A, wanting to manage my music career mm -hmm. or B, evolve in you know my production skills. Mm -hmm. So let's say you're a person like me, right? I love music, I love to listen to music, but I think that I wanna be a, a mu mu musical genius, right? Mm -hmm. But I don't know, right? I'm still young and I don't know. <laughs> Should I pursue going to a recording arts school or should I like go to school and then practice my craft after school or whenever I can? Should I, should I pick your school to go to or a school <laughs> like yours? Well, yeah, uh, there's one or two ways to go about it. Uh, primarily, uh, the one way I went, like I said, was I was you know pretty high functioning before I got to the school mm -hmm. and kind of got there and honed it or you can start from someplace like that, mm -hmm. which means like you're, ha you're gonna have the support of all the staff around you and everybody who wants to mentor you and things like that to get to where you want to go mm -hmm. after a school. But the one thing that I try and pride myself on or the one thing that I do try and uh, hammer home as far as like what people ask or like uh, how do I know this and that and the other is just researching on your own. Mm -hmm. You know, I've done a lot of research from home uh, on hip hop history, production arts, all the different softwares and stuff that I can get into. And then I kind of bring it back to the school because mm -hmm. a lot of kids come there with the idea or the impression that we're just gonna automatically make you this big, famous, uh, artistic genius and everything uh -huh. like that. But what it comes from is just diligence mm -hmm in focusing on yourself, regardless of if the school is there or not. Like I always try and tell kids that if you can't get the recording time at school, 
and you got to go somewhere else or um, you, you need to work something out at home and everything like that, you know, it's a tool, but it's not your primary way of, not your primary way of learning. Mm -hmm. You know, always research on what you want to do and reapply it and then just use schools or use research and use everything that you have mm -hmm. as a builder or a foundation. Gotcha. So last question I'll ask you, what advice would you give to anyone wanting to get into the industry? Lessons you've learned? Uh, as far as the industry, I would say one, remain independent. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, getting signed is always a big goal for a lot of people as far as like wanting to be represented by some major label and just get put on and everything like mm -hmm. that. Um, <clears throat> but in independence is key for me, you know, having full recording rights of my own stuff, uh, knowing that having security in the sense that I own all of my things, you know, having having security and knowing that I created all of this by myself. Uh, stay away from drugs, stay in school. You know, I, I, you know, I am completely sober and I take pride in that, you know, especially for around my age, because uh, a lot of the things that I've seen that I've seen from like older cats or even kids around my age is that a lot of their influence or their creative intuition comes from certain substances and things like that. Um, I, I very much stay away from them just so I can take pride in knowing that my creativity is my create, create ah, my creativity is my creativity mm. without influence or any uh, blocks or obscurities. But uh, yeah, stay independent, don't do drugs, consistently uh, hone your craft, and not all ideas are the best ideas. Consistently, consistently make bad product in order to make good product. That's the one way I get past producer's block. <laughs> Gotta be gritty. Absolutely. Yes, indeed. Well, DJ Mickey Breeze, thank you for your time today. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome back to Altitude, and with me today I have Geneva Dope. How are you doing, Geneva? I'm great, how are you? So we're gonna start talking about, in the world of STEAM, we're gonna talk pretty much about the engineering, the E, and a little bit about the T, right? So we're gonna talk all about robotics. Yes. All right, so as it relates to robotics, um, how did you become such a robotics genius? Where, I mean, how did you end up teaching these young kids about first robotics? Uh, FLL, as they call it, First Robotics Lego League, or yes. tell me about that. So, I am a biomedical engineer, okay. and I came up here to Minnesota to go to graduate school, mm -hmm. and then I ran into this PhD, program. right? Yes, PhD, PhD. program. Okay. Yes. Um, and there's this program that, you know, you volunteer to help kids learn robotics. And I was like, robotics? I have no idea what that is, but it sounds like an awesome opportunity and like a great way to, you know, teach sure. kids what robotics is while I'm teaching myself, you know? So, um, I joined an FLL team as an assistant coach, and a couple years later, here I am now coaching a team with Minnesota STEM Partnership. Wow, so, so yeah. you, tell me a little bit about your degree. That's pretty fascinating. Yeah, so biomedical engineering is a whole lot of different things, so mm -hmm. it encompasses a lot of stuff. So what I work on is I work on cancer research. Okay. So basically, I build models to study how cancer moves in the body. Cool. So I build fake blood vessels out of these tissues and then see how cancer cells move inside them. Wow. And yeah, like how the cells that we have in our bodies that are supposed to fight off cancer, how those actually help cancer. And if we can stop them from helping it, then hopefully we can stop it from spreading. Wow, so. God bless you for that one for yeah. sure. So did you always want to be this great person learning how to fight cancer or how did, how did you end up being where you're at today? Yeah, so I guess kind of how I started is I've always been really interested in animals. Okay. So from a really young age, I just loved looking at animals, like picking up bugs on the street, you know, finding, you know, <laughs> lizards and stuff. And so, like, you know how, like, when you catch a lizard, sometimes the tail falls off? Mm -hmm. And then you see the lizard later, and it kind of starts growing back? I was always curious, like, why lizards can grow parts back, but people can't. So I guess someone loses their leg. Why can't they just grow their leg back like a lizard can grow back its tail? That's so, pretty fascinating. Yeah. So you're telling me you didn't actually take a linear, straight path to where you're at today. How did, no. how did you actually uh, decide to go into that particular, uh, besides, you know, legs falling off and yeah. <laughs> growing back? So I really wanted to be a herpetologist, which is someone that studies reptiles and amphibians because of the lizard thing. Um, 
And then when I got to looking at colleges, there really aren't many colleges that you can go to to study that. Okay. So I was like, okay, what's a plan B? Like, you know what, I'm gonna be a doctor so I can help the people who you know, need it. And then along the way of, of that, I discovered this thing called biomedical engineering, but I really had no idea what it was. But I was like, mm -hmm. oh, that sounds pretty cool. Let's just go into it and see what happens. And That's pretty brave. That's I brave. really liked it, so here I am. So and here you are teaching robotics to kids. And yes. you are, tell us a little bit about the, a little bit about the team that you're uh, working with over in South Minneapolis. Yes, so we have a team there with a youth coalition called the Afrobot Boys, and we get together every Saturday, mm -hmm. and they kind of work, so they have these little Lego kits that they can build up. They have a computer brain that they can program. So they build all the parts for the robot to make it drive around and complete these different sure. tasks. So they can build arms for it and then program how it moves around the table. And it's pretty amazing, like within, you know, we've only met like, you know, maybe like eight or nine times and they've already have a robot that can complete some of these challenges and they built it from like nothing, so. From nothing, yeah. that's pretty incredible. So we're, uh, you're headed to a competition too this year, right? So this yes. is the first time that they'll compete in, in a regional competition. Is that considered regional? Can you share yes. a little bit about the competitions? So the competitions for Lego League, um, you have the regional competitions, like you mentioned, we have ours coming up on December 1st. And what you do is you take your robot you've been working on all semester, mm -hmm. and you can compete against other teams to see how many points you can get. Okay. And you kind of talk about how you designed your robot, because throughout the Lego League experience, you kind of learn like how to go through these design processes. So how can I complete this challenge? What do I need to build to make this work? Mm -hmm. How can I program it to make it work? Mm -hmm. So they kind of go in, discuss those sorts of things, mm -hmm. and then on the fly, they can pick up how to make theirs better. So. Man, that sounds really exciting. Yeah. However, like if I'm just at home and you know I, you know, I hear the word Lego, mm -hmm. quite honestly, the word Lego means playing with toys and building blocks. And you know, back when I was growing up, you could build houses and things like that out of Legos and there weren't any motors or robotic arms. So on one hand, it has kind of like a, a childish undertone, mm -hmm. but can you tell me a little bit about, uh, if I'm starting into it, you know, what would a young person, what should they know about starting into that, you know, to take a class or to get involved with a Lego club? And then secondarily, what type of jobs, I'll ask you that next, is what type of jobs can that actually lead to? So this little childish thing that people are kind of afraid to jump into, it actually ends up to be in this, you know, world-class, high-income, high-salary, great job type thing. So yeah. you can elaborate on those steps for the youngsters. That would be great. Yeah, definitely. So I, all the kids on our team have never done any sort of programming wow. or robotics before. Wow. So they started this, you know, they've met nine times, and they already have a working robot. So you really don't need to have any experience to get into it. Huh. So to find a place where you can get involved in something like Lego Robotics, like you can talk to, like, your school, there's mm -hmm. some like Minnesota STEM Partnership. You can look into that to see how you can get involved. Nice yeah. t-shirt, by the way, too. Minnesota yeah. STEM Partnership. Um, so you can look into like a lot of resources to see where you can find a team to join okay. if you're interested in like this as an opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. So I understand with the Minnesota STEM Partnership, we have the Afrobot boys that are over South Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. There's another team that I think that you're going to substitute at next week called the ProBot Kids. It stands yes. for Progressive Baptist robot kids, but they yes. kind of shrunk it up. Mm -hmm. And are you excited to go visit them? Yeah, I'm really excited to meet some new kids and see how it's going and yeah. hopefully help them before their competition as well. Sure, so, sure. it'll be a really good experience. And they have a third team that's over in North Minneapolis mm -hmm. called the, I think they're called the Robo Rockets and they're run by um, Alan Stovall. Yes. And they are kids from Franklin Middle School. Mm -hmm. So the way I understand it is because of the way that the public school systems are organized, and the way that FIRST Robotics works is a student cannot participate or compete in different levels of robotics activities. So really, uh, the purpose of the Minnesota STEM Partnership then is to take these kids out of these you know, public schools or you know, community or after school club and give them the opportunity to, to move further along that robotics uh, platform, if you will. To, instead of just learning some basic things, they can actually maybe get a chance to advance or succeed. With your experience with the Afrobot boys mm -hmm. and the students that you have, do you think that's a good model? Do you think that is actually something that will benefit kids? Yeah, I think so, because a lot of kids come in and like I said, none of them have any experience in this. Mm -hmm. So you sit down with one, I'm like, hey, like, let's program this. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, I can't. It's like, oh, why not? Sure. Because I've never programmed before. I was like, okay, let's learn. Yeah. And now they're all just running around like programming without me even saying anything. So it's amazing watching them grow from people who are 
you know, like a little nervous to get started, but then eventually, like it's over a short amount of time, they figure it out and they just get it and run with it, and it's amazing. Yeah, yeah. So. I know when I approached Reverend Miller over at Progressive Baptist, he was very excited because they have a large congregation, and the trainers over there are Janelle and Michael, mm -hmm. and I know that they were really excited. They're, if I'm mistaken, their team is made up of like, uh, they're very young, mm -hmm. I'll just say. It's not a junior league team, but it's a very young team, and they have just, they dove into this thing. It's pretty amazing. They had some experience in the background, but I think um, the footage that we're going to see of the robotics, you know, the teams competing and all the kids that have been act, um, actively working with their trainers, I just hope and pray that all this work that you guys have been putting in actually will resonate with the kids. They'll lock in and say, hey, this stuff is really going to move me along that career pathway. Because at the end of the day, robotics, right? If we just singularly look at the technology and engineering aspects of robotics, everything around us is gonna be automated to a certain mm -hmm. degree. You know, we're gonna hear about drones and virtual reality and you know, first person viewing and all that stuff, but within the realm of robotics, it's really something that if you don't jump into these technologies now, mm -hmm. you're gonna get left behind, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. um, share with me a little bit about where you think your involvement will be as it relates to um, your your education and then robotics. So kind of a trick question. Do you see robotics in your industry heavily or taking over or share your thoughts on robotics in your particular industry that you're, your degree that you're going into? Yes, so in my industry there is like robotics are everywhere. Mm -hmm. So I mean you have automated surgeries. So you have a robot that goes in and your doctor can remotely control the surgery with this robot. Remotely? Yeah, you can do it remotely now. Like what, playing PlayStation and then? Yeah, so you have like an expert in a surgery <clears throat> somewhere. Okay. You don't have to just go, like you don't have to fly the patient to that place to get the surgery done. Wow. The doctors can do it remotely. You have other doctors on standby obviously to help, yeah. but like, that's incredible. So that is real. That's that not is, just that science real. fiction. Yeah. That's real. So I could be in Alabama mm -hmm. and be a doctor and actually do the surgery on somebody in Minnesota, mm -hmm. theoretically yes. speaking, with much infrastructure, yeah, pullover lots. systems, and all that kind of good stuff, right? High yes. speed networks. Yes. All right. Um, I didn't mean to cut you off because oh, that was actually fine. pretty cool. <laughs> so the other aspect of it is do you think that the robotics industry itself will be a commonplace. So you know how things come in, they're very expensive, mm -hmm. but then over time they become a lot mm -hmm. cheaper. Mm -hmm. Share a little bit about that. Do you think robotics will get cheaper? Yeah, I think the more we learn about it and the better we get at developing these technologies, the cheaper they'll get just like with like, you know, cell phones. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Put a whole lot of power into one tiny cell phone when back in the day you had a suitcase and it was, you know, <laughs> Absolutely. a lot more of that. So I think just like that, robotics will also Sure. evolve that direction as well sure. so and uh, we had one professor dr. Monica Anderson Herzog from the University of Alabama Tus Tuscaloosa who was online with the Minnesota stem partnership and she shared her thoughts on where robotics was actually going mm -hmm. and so we're gonna cut away real quickly to hear what dr. Anderson Herzog had to say all right so one one so I'm gonna wrap up, so three, two, one. Well, Geneva, it was a pleasure meeting with you today. Thank you for your time and energy. Is there anything you wanna to say to the audience or to a young person out there related to jumping into robotics or anything in STEAM? Yeah, so I guess my advice would just be, you know, don't be scared to face challenges. Like, you can do it. Just, you know, learn from your mistakes and power through and keep going with it. And Probably if true. you're interested in it, then you can do it. So go Fantastic. for it. Fantastic. Well, yeah. thank you very much. Thanks so much for having me. <laughs>
along with the national organization, had a conference here, a Blacks in Tech conference yeah. during Startup Week. Um, and I think those BitCon, are the- BitCon, 18. BitCon, I remember the hashtag. 18. I was yeah. there. So, yeah. <laughs> I think that's the major things. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you for joining us. One of the things we want to talk about is how we can get young people involved and interested in coding. Mm -hmm. And I know here uh, we heard from the Minnesota STEM Partnership. We actually are finding organizations that specialize in coding. But we aren't going to do any coding programs. We're trying to find those, those groups and those participants, uh, member organizations that will take on kids. Mm -hmm. And we'll try to direct the kids that are involved in other programs over there. However, you present a very unique and interesting perspective is you must have learned coding somewhere along the way, and now you're your own businesswoman. Mm -hmm. So can you share for our younger audience what your history or background was that got you inspired to pursue to get to where you're at today mm -hmm. in technology? Yeah, I think I was really fortunate. My um, mother and my father both kind of worked around computers. My mom mm -hmm. was an administrative assistant, so she went from typewriters to like word processors. Mm -hmm. um, and we had one in the home because she did like side work, you know? Mm -hmm. So we had a computer in the home, so I was like familiar with, uh, with computers. Mm -hmm. um, and then my dad was always like, He's a civil engineer and he always had things he had to do with IT, so he was like familiar with like punch cards and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Um, so I think kind of having people that like were familiar, like my parents, and then having a computer in the home was kind of part of it. Um, but I didn't really get into it until we got AOL. So AOL is a service. Wait, wait, the dial-up. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, AOL is a, Back in the day. was an online service. Probably still an online service. You can still have an AOL email address. Um, so America Online is how we connected to the internet via a dial-up connection, uh, which is very slow compared to what we have now. You could like try and look at an image, but then you would walk away until the image actually loaded. Um, so it was super slow, but it was super exciting for me, especially like as an introverted child and just someone that like would sit at home and like read books and then I could get on like the internet. And it was like my first kind of foray into social media and my first mm -hmm. foray into like changing things on the internet, mm -hmm. um, being able to like build a web page. And back then like, web pages were super simple. It was just like some HTML tags and then you had inline CSS. And it was kind of like, I don't know, it was a free place to play. And so that's kind of like where it started. Okay. So you matched your natural instinct for technology with kind of your artistic side of it too, right? Being able to create web pages. Mm -hmm. um, it's not just a nerdy thing. I mean, you have to have many skills to be able to develop yeah. Uh, software. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean. I always say I'm not creative, but I'm actually creative. Like I will literally like work on a PowerPoint presentation for hours because I find it fascinating. <laughs> and um, and I and like coding is also like you're creating things. So you're creating a web page or you're creating an algorithm, which is just mm -hmm. instructions for how to do something. And if you're creative and you are not like really artistic, but you kind of like building things, I think coding is definitely like a thing that you might want to get involved in. Yeah. Yeah. Today, you know, technology has changed way since AOL, right? So we don't have dial-up. Um, but many of our students, they have access to internet, but sometimes it's at school, mm -hmm. sometimes it's at the library, or sometimes it's just at, you know, I know many McDonald's and other uh, retail organizations have free Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. So sometimes access to the internet is a little bit difficult. Mm -hmm. um, if you could just share a little bit for our younger audience, what types of tools, how could they build something on, their own laptop or on their phone. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to create a web page locally on their laptop or phone without the internet? Wow, so on phones, I, I don't know. Um, probably, but I've, I, I feel like it would be difficult. I haven't looked into that, but on your laptop, mm -hmm. definitely. So you don't need an internet connection to run a web page. You need an internet connection to run a web page that's hosted somewhere else. Oh. But on your own machine, you can still write HTML and you can actually like write a like create a file that's called like index.html, put some HTML tags in it, and then um, if you're on a Windows machine or maybe even if you're on a Mac, just double click on that mm -hmm. icon of the file and then it opens in your browser and there's like a web page. Mm -hmm. But the idea though is that a lot of um, coders actually use the internet to figure out how to do these things. So that's kind of the hard part. So mm -hmm. first you would want to have like a book. There's so mm -hmm. many books out there that you can get, um, like go to half price books tons of books that are super cheap about web development. They're a little older, but 
they're what you need because the fun fundamentals have not changed. So sure, yeah. sure. And I know even in their high schools or middle schools or elementary schools, mm -hmm. now some of the libraries have coding books oh, too. Oh, for sure. So, I mean, they can even go locally or the public library. Yeah. I was just uh, researching some other information. I found there was HTML and other books mm -hmm. out there. So. What types, what would be the, the best languages or what language, software languages would you suggest that a young person would learn? And then what should they really look at? What's the end game? What would be the best language for them to learn so in five years from now, mm -hmm. they would have all the skills and software development? Yeah, I wish that there was a, <laughs> a magic answer for that. Um, the fact is, is that like, so JavaScript is big, JavaScript mm -hmm. is huge, and that's that's actually pretty good because anyone can write JavaScript. Like, so remember, you don't have an internet connection. You can also write JavaScript files locally and mm -hmm. run them. So mm -hmm. that's a good one to learn because yeah. a lot of people. You don't need the internet. You yeah. don't need the internet, yeah. and like everyone's using it. Um, Node.js, which is server side, mm -hmm. uses it. Um, client side frameworks use it. A framework is like a, it's like oh man, it's a library. A library is a bunch of code that mm -hmm. allows you to do some things. Sure. So like being able to use those libraries and being able to just like know the syntax of JavaScript is probably like the best place to be right now. I, I would agree with that because I learned JavaScript a long, long time ago to do. I mean, it's probably JavaScript one battle, of <laughs> yeah. course, you know, before punch cards. But JavaScript is actually very powerful. You know, it can run, you can create data types, like you said, algorithms and mm -hmm. solve problems. So yep. I would definitely give a big plus to JavaScript as a good intermediate uh, language that they could pursue. Mm -hmm. So tell me just a little bit about what the professionals are using today and if you can uh, share how you would feed if you've ever worked in any DevOps type environments or mm -hmm. any corporate or other major like Java type languages. Mm -hmm. If you can share your experience or opinion on any of those uh, higher level languages. Sure, yeah, I mean, I've worked in basically, I've worked in a lot of languages. So um, I worked in Java, um, Java 6, and I mean, it's a perfectly fine language. They're always updating it. Java mm -hmm. 8 has a lot of really cool features. Um, I've worked in .NET. Right mm -hmm. now, .NET Core is super cool. Um, I've mm -hmm. really enjoyed working in that. Um, I've done JavaScript frameworks like Angular and React. Um, and then what else? Oh, PHP. PHP mm -hmm. runs a bunch of websites. You may find some people that are like, oh, PHP isn't a real language, but it's totally a real language and lots of people use it. So sure, uh, sure. so I've done PHP too. <laughs> Man, you, what haven't you done, I guess, in terms COBOL. of language? <laughs> <laughs> I've done yeah, COBOL. Yeah, you've done COBOL. That's crazy, yeah. I, I've done COBOL. And by the way, uh, I've done punch cards. Probably oh, might wow. have been so shoulder to shoulder with your dad back in the day. So, uh, But I did start young, so mm -hmm. just in case. Yeah, so no, that's pretty fascinating. In terms of the work that you do, um, would you suggest that a young per would you suggest a young person learn on their own? Obviously, right. So they should uh, follow up on these internet resources. Mm -hmm. You know, find the language of the free stuff. Mm -hmm. Go to the library. But as it relates to their education, should a young person pursue getting uh, one of three things? You know, should they get a cert should they just be getting a certificate? in like Java or JavaScript, because you can get certified, right? Mm -hmm. And then you can go and get a bachelor's degree, a four-year degree or something mm -hmm. like that in software or computer science. And then you can just be self-taught. Mm -hmm. And then I want your straight opinion because everybody um, does it differently. Yeah. So what's your thoughts on what type of education should I pursue you know, as I plan, as I go through high school and put my, my development plan together. Okay, yeah, so this is obviously my personal opinion. Yeah, um, absolutely. <laughs> so I don't have a computer science degree. Mm -hmm. um, I have a degree in technical communication. Mm -hmm. uh, I do have a minor in computer science because I was kind of interested in it, mm -hmm. but I didn't want to spend my entire education learning it. It just wasn't really for me. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's highly the theoretical. Um, I do have a master's in software engineering, which is more about the application of computer science, and that was the thing I was most interested in. Mm -hmm. um, however, like you can totally self-teach yourself all of these things. I think one of the things, especially in the Twin Cities, um, if you're planning to stay here, that's important is just kind of knowing how development works like as a team. So a lot of what people are looking for right now is can you work in a team? Like and can you follow our processes? And I think that solo coders, especially people that um, want to just write code all by themselves, 
are not going to do so well in this economy and future economies um, because software is getting just more and more complicated and in a way that one person can't build it all. Um, so I think that's important. But like whether you do computer science, you could totally do some other major that you really love and you could also just kind of like learn to code on the internet, things like Treehouse and Code Academy and that sort of thing. And the thing is is that like you'll have like the college background of like being able to learn things and then you'll have like the practical application of like seeing how things are built because the things that Code Academy does is it kind of shows you how to structure your code, yeah. which is important when you're trying to get a job because there are certain things that uh, tech companies are still not good at actually training people on. <laughs> and so being able to know a few of those things is super useful. Yeah. Yeah. So in terms of salary and uh, benefits and all the other, you know, the, the grown, grown up things that you yeah. typically, you know, pursue, mm -hmm. um, the money that you can make as an independent business person or the money that you can make going to work for mm -hmm. a major company or a small company. Mm -hmm. Share your thoughts on that. Yeah. Um, Developers make a lot of money right now. Software engineers are making a lot of money, and I think they will continue to for a while. Um, I think from a financial perspective, if you're not really sure what you want to do, it's good to just say, oh, yeah, I'm going to be a coder. Because the fact is, is that you can move through all types of different industries with, a co with coding experience. Um, and also, the good thing about working in a company is health insurance. Health insurance is way less expensive. <laughs> um, yep. and, you're, and typically, you, can, you get better care because like, your employer is just able to kind of cover a lot more than you can independently. I think the most frustrating thing I've found as a person who has to deal with their own health insurance is the cost and then just finding out that it's just nowhere near as good as what I had when mm -hmm. I was um, with a company. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the things to think about. However, I have a lot of freedom. I have a lot more freedom than at a company. Like I set, I don't have to conform to a culture that maybe makes me uncomfortable. And so, and I get to stay at home a lot, <laughs> and, which I really like um, because I hate driving in the winter here. So yeah. In Minnesota, those, we do have that snow to deal with though. We? Yes. And parking and all the other issues that exactly. go along with that. So. <laughs> Yeah, no, thank you for your opinion on that because that's always been the struggle is, you know, you develop this creative talent and then, you know, do you go wing it on your own? Do you moonlight mm -hmm. or do you, you know, create a longer term plan where you might go work for a company, get yourself established, mm -hmm. get health care? Because we know with the recent elections, you know, health care is a big, you know, it's an important thing. Yeah. And then make your decisions along the way. So you have, what you're saying is you don't have to just follow a straight path. No. You can actually build your own portfolio, build your own career, mm -hmm. and then use software as really the money-making tool to advance yourself you know, as you become an adult and, and move forward. Um, before we break, though, is there anything that you would like to say about um, any organizations, or can you tell us a little bit about the recent VidCon and how it maybe right, might relate to the coding aspect and entrepreneurs? Do you have anything you'd like to share in that regard? Ah. Uh. No, I don't. Um, I'll throw you for a little bit. Yeah. We're going to cut this one. Okay, right, thank you. Know, you. That's we'll, good. We'll make sure that we cut this part out of it, hopefully. Okay. We'll do the fade to, fade to, fade to black. But, um, so the, the purpose of actually asking you that was, you know, when we, get, when we go to conferences, mm -hmm. you know, we come together. Mm -hmm. And I think the biggest thing out of that was you had talked about uh, being able to work as a team, mm -hmm. right? And so to host a major conference like the great BitCon 18 that just happened, mm -hmm. You had to work with a, a whole team of people. Were all the people here locally, or were they across the United States? Right. Yeah. The the BigCon. So BigCon was officially the national Blacks in Tech, um, mm -hmm. and not the Twin Cities chapter. So mm -hmm. uh, it was actually organized by people in many different states: um, California, Ohio, I think Pennsylvania. So that teamwork, because I think one thing that you said earlier about coding was really about teamwork. Mm -hmm. So you can work in isolation, but really you also have to be able to work with other people mm -hmm. and that's really going to determine your success levels right mm -hmm. so you can stay isolated be creative or you can really grow so we really appreciate BitCon picking you know the Twin Cities we appreciate you as being uh, co-founder of the local chapter as well mm -hmm. because I think it's organizations like that they're that going to move the ball forward in the Twin Cities mm -hmm. and the Twin Cities right now I think we're um, the unemployment level I mean they're looking for people mm -hmm. you know with technology skills so yeah. Part of the, the purpose of the Minnesota STEM partnership is to, to move younger kids along that pipeline earlier. Because mm -hmm. by the time they reach a higher grade level, you know, they've already started to get other activities and be focused yeah. elsewhere. So, you know, it's a longer term play, but 
um, bringing Bitcoin to the Twin Cities, I think, was just absolutely incredible. Cool. Just, so thank you all for bringing that, bringing that here. Um, my last question really surrounds any other um, activities that you have. Uh, I know that you've been involved with an organization in North Minneapolis called Sisters in Technology. Mm -hmm. you, know, you took a preview and, and assisted there. But grassroots initiatives and in codings, how could a, an adult or a parent or a technical person, a professional that, you know, kind of busy lives and stuff like that, mm -hmm. do you think that it's a wise investment to start a coding club? Hmm. I mean, a coding club for like children or for yeah. like, or for adults? Young people. Young people, okay. Yeah. Um, I think that it's a great idea if you can make a coding club happen. So mm -hmm. the things that we have going on in the Twin Cities are, you know, we have Code Savvy, which um, is an umbrella organization that does coder dojos, mm -hmm. um, which I think are really cool and they kind of have like a set thing that they do and they mm -hmm. execute it really well. Um, however, unfortunately, I think they don't reach as much of our demographic or yeah, people yeah. of color demographic, um, that would be great. Um, is BDPA well, still? Where, yeah, oh. I was gonna say that's where BDPA, a BD, yeah. you know, Black Data Processing Associates comes into play. They run a spring program uh, that teaches them those languages that you mm -hmm. were talking about, very productive program. It's kind of one of the unsung quiet organizations, but they're pretty powerful in terms of the actual coding the kids ability to code as they deliver mm -hmm. but you you know you've also got to scale up they're a completely volunteer organization too mm -hmm. and that in and of itself yeah, you know has it's challenges difficult. yeah for sure so. no i mean i have literally been in conversations about like coding clubs uh over the years so many times mm -hmm. and um to my knowledge, none of them have ever gotten off the ground, any mm -hmm. additional ones. Mm -hmm. um, I think it would be great. I think, again, like when it's a volunteer organization, people are so busy these days. People have their jobs and their jobs mm -hmm. often take a lot of, out of them, especially as knowledge workers. It's just kind of a different kind of work. And by the time you get to a weekend or a place where you have free time, you're kind of spent. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's some challenges there. There's also challenges in like having space, you mm -hmm. know. Um, one of the things that I will mention, though, is uh, there's a website called Glitch. Um, mm -hmm. And so when I used to volunteer at BDPA, um, the, the most frustrating thing that I found was, like, you go and you have this computer lab, which was donated to us, and it was, it was great to have that. But it's like you get to the computers, and they're all Windows machines. Most mm -hmm. developers here uh, are on Macs, which are a completely yeah. different operating system. So you're a little unfamiliar. And then secondly, like the software you need isn't on there. Mm -hmm. And then thirdly, there's often like accounts and things that you need that kids just don't have. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, so now you have to either create a bunch of accounts for all of these children and then like store the passwords on sheets of paper. Um, Real secure. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there is uh, this new site called Glitch. Um, and you can go to that site and you can just build an app. You can like have an app that's already there and you can remix it and then that basically like copies the code for you and then you just do it in the browser. Hmm. You don't have to be signed in and you can cool. see it. So I think like things like that are going to help with the one part about like the computer, I don't know what the computer is, and I'm like scared. But um, <laughs> uh, otherwise, I, I mean, I would love to do something like that. Um, but it's like finding the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No. Well, again, thank you for your volunteering with the many organizations mm -hmm. and driving that that ball forwards, as they say, uh, so that our kids have a great opportunity to have fantastic careers and become great entrepreneurs like yourself. <laughs> and many others. Uh, so thank you, Antoinette. We appreciate your time for coming here. Yeah, today. thanks for having me. Right, thank you. Right. Welcome back. With me today, I have Jorian Wolf with the Midwest Drone League. How you doing today, Jorian? Doing pretty good. How about yourself? I'm doing pretty good. You have a really cool name. I thought I'd just point that out. <laughs> it's funny how those things work out. So, under the Minnesota STEM partnership, I see you guys have started uh, focusing on drones. We have. And you have, and uh, started the Midwest Drone League. So, the Midwest Drone League is really about getting young kids involved with learning how to fly, learning how to do uh, av aviation, as well as, it's not just for fun, ultimately as adults, our goal is to take kids and help give them skills and help them learn. But at the end of the day, we really want them to get FAA licensing, right? 
So we want these kids to be drone pilots and all that kind of stuff. So um, what do you have here? I see that you bought a drone with you or the actual drone that we're going to get to run in the league, right? Yep, exactly. So what I got here today is I actually got a few things. So this little device right here is the over the head of view for first person video. And you can actually put the monitor that's right here on the okay on the uh, remote control. So you mm -hmm. can put that right in the front. And there you go. You can fly the drone, which is called a tiny whoop right here. It's just a little guy. And this actually has a camera built into it. So like I was saying, the camera's right here. Just put it on here. And then you can actually see first person like you're actually so, flying. So when I, if I was to run the control panel thing there, I could actually fly the drone and I could see where I'm going. So I could be facing that way and then fly the drone through a course the complete opposite direction. Exactly. Wow, that's, so this FPV is first person viewer, so it's me and my drone and what I can see through the, the display. Yep. Well, that's pretty cool. That's pretty it might cool. be a little tough because if you're sitting one way, you gotta figure out which way, you know, you actually gotta fly the thing. Oh, okay, so, there, <laughs> so you might wanna be focused in the right direction. So the purpose of the league really is to teach the kids how to, one, fly the drone safely, two, participate in league activities with teamwork, because to my, and understand it, there is a protocol to it. It's much like, you know, we're here in Minnesota, so a lot of people can relate to hockey leagues, right? Where you yep. have the, the little kids running around skating, and bumping into each other. The same thing with the drone league that we're trying to achieve is try to get the kids to understand that there is a protocol and order and a, a organization behind it. So the way that I think that this league is going to play out is they're going to meet every third Saturday of the month, starting in January, correct? January of 2019. Yep. And then they'll meet on the off week so that the kids that don't have drones, um, because one thing we really am appreciative of here with the Minnesota STEM Partnership is there's a sponsor that has volunteered to give uh, you know, half a dozen drones to the organization for the kids to use, right? So very much a big shout out to Hub Hobby, Todd, and Big Black who couldn't be here today. Yep. He's actually flying a commercial drone, I understand, out in the Colorado Rockies. <laughs> so, you know, would you pick to be in cold Minnesota in the snow or cold snow in Colorado? I probably would pick Colorado with all the mountains, right? Especially playing with a multi-thousand dollar drone, I would too. Yeah. So speaking <laughs> of which, if I wanted to buy this drone, what's the, what's the cost point on this thing? About $175, $180 for the whole setup? For the whole set, that is pretty much spot on for it. Okay. It's okay. not too much. So just in time for the, uh, the gift season coming yeah. up, right, to be politically correct. Any parent that has the means to do this, uh, when, they drone, when they join the Drone League, they can actually buy one of these things or um, they will have enough supply so that the students can actually come up and try them. Because one of the things that I understand with the Minnesota STEM Partnership is to create a barrier-free activity right, in these advancing and emerging technologies. So we're not just about, you know, having things to do to fill time. Every single STEAM-related activity, whether it's technical or arts, will take them to a job or a career, a choice in education or a choice in a, in a you know, long-lasting career where they can make now a lot of money, right? So drones are in almost every industry too. So I mean, we can talk about pizza delivery, we can talk about package delivery, which are kind of the blue collar of the drone market, right? Yep. But there's, um, are there any particular applications that if I became a drone pilot, is there any type of job or anything that you can see this would actually fit perfectly into? Uh, first thing that comes to mind, something that everybody probably is gonna see like almost on a daily basis is house hunting type of deal. So oh. like the drones, they'll have a camera underneath, you know. This one is a first person front mounted facing one, so you actually gotta look that way, but the $100,000 cameras, not 100,000, but thousands of dollar cameras you see where you got the little uh, oh, gyro. High definition. Yeah, the gyro pixel. camera on the bottom yeah. and then yeah. overview camera type yeah. of deal. Because that application would apply to real estate, it would apply to agriculture, it would military. apply to military. Um, one other thing, there's a group down in uh, Kansas City named Esteem Village, and I know there's affiliated with him is this architecture firm, uh, Mike Rendler out in, in Los Angeles. But I was joking around saying you could take a drone with a you know, high definition x-ray camera and then fly up and scan a building, mm -hmm. right? And then you can actually, as a x-ray the building, you can see how many pipes are in the building, what kind of electrical needs are, and you can almost convert that into a CAD CAM. So I mean, 
even today there's applications for having drone pilot skills. And so getting back to what the kids can actually expect is you can actually get your drone pilot license at age 16. Hmm. Did you know that? This brand new information. <laughs> so there's a FAA offers a variety of different licenses. So at the Minnesota STEM partnership, what I understand is that any students that stick with it, we will actually try to find scholarships and funding to pay for their drone license at age 16. So that's cool. kind of a cool thing. That is. Yeah, that is. I wish somebody was giving me a free free driver's license at age 16. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of, it's one of those things that you just got to put in the sweat equity for. So thank you for joining us today. We appreciate it. And show us a little bit about what this thing could do. Take us on a real quick try. Yeah, I'm not seeing your papers, but. Oh man, look at that thing go. And there it goes. That's too the way many, it goes, all right. Too many signals. Thank you, have a great day. <laughs>